section five of curiosities of literature volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume three by isaac disraeli the philosophy of proverbs part one in antique furniture we sometimes discover a convenience which long disuse has made us unacquainted with and are surprised by the aptness which we did not suspect was concealed in its solid forms we have found the labour of the workman to have been as admirable as the material itself which is still resisting the mouldering touch of time among those modern inventions elegant and unsubstantial which often put together with unseasoned wood are apt to warp and fly into pieces when brought into use we have found how strength consists in the selection of materials and that whenever the substitute is not better than the original we are losing something in that test of experience which all things derive from duration be this as it may i shall not unreasonably await for the artists of our novelties to retrograde into massive greatness although i cannot avoid reminding them how often they revive the forgotten things of past times it is well known that many of our novelties were in use by our ancestors in the history of the human mind there is indeed a sort of antique furniture which i collect not merely for their antiquity but for the sound condition in which i still find them and the compactness which they still show centuries have not worm-eaten their solidity and the utility and delightfulness which they still afford make them look as fresh and as ingenious as any of our patent inventions by the title of the present article the reader has anticipated the nature of the old furniture to which i allude i propose to give what in the style of our times may be called the philosophy of proverbs a topic which seems virgin the art of reading proverbs has not indeed always been acquired even by some of their admirers but my observations like their subject must be versatile and unconnected and i must bespeak indulgence for an attempt to illustrate a very curious branch of literature rather not understood than quite forgotten proverbs have long been in disuse a man of fashion observes lord chesterfield never has recourse to proverbs and vulgar aphorisms and since the time his lordship so solemnly interdicted their use they appear to have withered away under the ban of his anathema his lordship was little conversant with the history of proverbs and would unquestionably have smiled on those men of fashion of another stamp who in the days of elizabeth james and charles were great collectors of them would appeal to them in their conversations and enforce them in their learned or their statesmanlike correspondence few perhaps even now suspect that these neglected fragments of wisdom which exist among all nations still offer many interesting objects for the studies of the philosopher and the historian and for men of the world still open an extensive school of human life and manners the homespun adages and the rusty said saws which remain in the mouths of the people are adapted to their capacities and their humours easily remembered and readily applied these are the philosophy of the vulgar and often more sound than that of their masters whoever would learn what the people think and how they feel must not reject even these as insignificant the proverbs of the street and of the market true to nature and lasting only because they are true are records that the populace at athens and at rome were the same people as at paris and at london and as they had before been in the city of jerusalem proverbs existed before books the spaniards date the origin of their refranes que dixen las viejas tras el fuego sayings of old wives by their firesides before the existence of any writings in their language from the circumstance that these are in the old romance or rudest vulgar idiom 
the most ancient poem in the edda the sublime speech of odin abounds with ancient proverbs strikingly descriptive of the ancient scandinavians undoubtedly proverbs in the earliest ages long served as the unwritten language of morality and even of the useful arts like the oral traditions of the jews they floated down from age to age on the lips of successive generations the name of the first sage who sanctioned the saying would in time be forgotten while the opinion the metaphor or the expression remained consecrated into a proverb such was the origin of those memorable sentences by which men learnt to think and to speak appositely they were precepts which no man could contradict at a time when authority was valued more than opinion and experience preferred to novelty the proverbs of a father became the inheritance of a son the mistress of a family perpetuated hers through her household the workman condensed some traditional secret of his craft into a proverbial expression when countries are not yet populous and property has not yet produced great inequalities in its ranks every day will show them how the drunkard and the glutton come to poverty and drowsiness clothes a man with rags at such a period he who gave counsel gave wealth it might therefore have been decided a priori that the most homely proverbs would abound in the most ancient writers and such we find in hesiod a poet whose learning was not drawn from books it could only have been in the agricultural state that this venerable bard could have indicated a state of repose by this rustic proverb pedalion men uper cap nu catadio hang your plough-beam o'er the hearth the envy of rival workmen is as justly described by a reference to the humble manufacturers of earthenware as by the elevated jealousies of the literati and the artists of a more polished age the famous proverbial verse in hesiod's works and days kai karameus karamei kotii is literally the potter is hostile to the potter the admonition of the poet to his brother to prefer a friendly accommodation to a litigious lawsuit has fixed a paradoxical proverb often applied plion e misu pantas the half is better than the whole in the progress of time the stock of popular proverbs received accessions from the highest sources of human intelligence as the philosophers of antiquity formed their collections they increased in weight and number erasmus has pointed out some of these sources in the responses of oracles the allegorical symbols of pythagoras the verses of the poets allusions to historical incidents mythology and apologue and other recondite origins such dissimilar matters coming from all quarters were melted down into this vast body of aphoristic knowledge those words of the wise and their dark sayings as they are distinguished in that large collection which bears the name of the great hebrew monarch at length seem to have required commentaries for what else can we infer of the enigmatic wisdom of the sages when the royal perimiographer classes among their studies that of understanding a proverb and the interpretation this elevated notion of the dark sayings of the wise accords with the bold conjecture of their origin which the staggerite has thrown out who considered them as the wrecks of an ancient philosophy which had been lost to mankind by the fatal revolutions of all human things and that those had been saved from the general ruin by their pithy elegance and their diminutive form like those marine shells found on the tops of mountains the relics of the deluge even at a later period the sage of cheronea prized them among the most solemn mysteries and plutarch has described them in a manner which proverbs may even still merit under the veil of these curious sentences are hid those germs of morals which the masters of philosophy have afterwards developed into so many volumes 
at the highest period of grecian genius the tragic and the comic poets introduced into their dramas the proverbial style st paul quotes a line which still remains among the first exercises of our school pens evil communications corrupt good manners it is a verse found in a fragment of menander the comic poet pythereusin hethi cresph homiliae cacae as this verse is a proverb and the apostle and indeed the highest authority jesus himself consecrates the use of proverbs by their occasional application it is uncertain whether st paul quotes the grecian poet or only repeats some popular adage proverbs were bright shafts in the greek and latin quivers and when bentley by a league of superficial wits was accused of pedantry for his use of some ancient proverbs the sturdy critic vindicated his taste by showing that cicero constantly introduced greek proverbs into his writings that scaliger and erasmus loved them and had formed collections drawn from the stores of antiquity some difficulty has occurred in the definition proverbs must be distinguished from proverbial phrases and from sententious maxims but as proverbs have many faces from their miscellaneous nature the class itself scarcely admits of any definition when johnson defined a proverb to be a short sentence frequently repeated by the people this definition would not include the most curious ones which have not always circulated among the populace nor even belong to them nor does it designate the vital qualities of a proverb the pithy quaintness of old howe has admirably described the ingredients of an exquisite proverb to be sense shortness and salt a proverb is distinguished from a maxim or an apothem by that brevity which condenses a thought or a metaphor where one thing is said and another is to be applied this often produces wit and that quick pungency which excites surprise but strikes with conviction this gives it an epigrammatic turn george herbert entitled the small collection which he formed iacula prudentium darts or javelins something hurled and striking deeply a characteristic of a proverb which possibly herbert may have borrowed from a remarkable passage in plato's dialogue of protagoras or the sophists the influence of proverbs over the minds and conversations of a whole people is strikingly illustrated by this philosopher's explanation of the term to to laconize the mode of speech peculiar to the lacedaemonians this people affected to appear unlearned and seemed only emulous to excel the rest of the greeks in fortitude and in military skill according to plato's notion this was really a political artifice with a view to conceal their pre-eminent wisdom with the jealousy of a petty state they attempted to confine their renowned sagacity within themselves and under their military to hide their contemplative character the philosopher assures those who in other cities imagined they laconized merely by imitating the severe exercises and the other warlike manners of the lacedaemonians that they were grossly deceived and thus curiously describes the sort of wisdom which this singular people practised if any one wish to converse with the meanest of the lacedaemonians he will at first find him for the most part apparently despicable in conversation but afterwards when a proper opportunity presents itself this same mean person like a skilful jaculator will hurl a sentence worthy of attention short and contorted so that he who converses with him will appear to be in no respect superior to a boy that to laconize therefore consists much more in philosophizing than in the love of exercise as understood by some of the present age and was known to the ancients they being persuaded that the ability of uttering such sentences as these is the province of a man perfectly learned the seven sages were emulators lovers and disciples of the lacedaemonian erudition their wisdom was a thing of this kind viz short sentences uttered by each and worthy to be remembered these men assembling together consecrated to apollo the first fruits of their wisdom writing in the temple of apollo at delphi those sentences which are celebrated by all men viz know thyself and nothing too much 
but on what account do i mention these things to show that the mode of philosophy among the ancients was a certain laconic diction the laconisms of the lacedaemonians evidently partook of the proverbial style they were no doubt often proverbs themselves the very instances which plato supplies of this laconizing are two most venerable proverbs all this elevates the science of proverbs and indicates that these abridgments of knowledge convey great results with a parsimony of words prodigal of sense they have therefore preserved many a short sentence not repeated by the people it is evident however that the earliest writings of every people are marked by their most homely or domestic proverbs for these were more directly addressed to their wants franklin who may be considered as the founder of a people who were suddenly placed in a stage of civil society which as yet could afford no literature discovered the philosophical cast of his genius when he filled his almanacs with proverbs by the ingenious contrivance of framing them into a connected discourse delivered by an old man attending an auction these proverbs he tells us which contained the wisdom of many ages and nations when their scattered councils were brought together made a great impression they were reprinted in britain in a large sheet of paper and stuck up in houses and were twice translated in france and distributed among their poor parishioners the same occurrence had happened with us ere we became a reading people sir thomas elliot in the reign of henry the eighth describing the ornaments of a nobleman's house among his hangings and plate and pictures notices the engraving of proverbs on his plate and vessels which served the guests with a most opportune counsel and comments later even than the reign of elizabeth our ancestors had proverbs always before them on everything that had room for a piece of advice on it they had them painted in their tapestries stamped on the most ordinary utensils on the blades of their knives footnote shakespeare satirically alludes to the quality of such rhymes in his merchant of venice act five scene one speaking of one whose poesy was for all the world like cutler's poetry upon a knife love me and leave me not End of footnote. the borders of their plates footnote one of the fruit trenchers for such these roundels are called in the gentleman's magazine for seventeen ninety eight page three hundred and ninety eight is engraved there and the inscriptions of an entire set given see also the supplement to that volume page one thousand one hundred and eighty seven the author of the art of english poesy fifteen eighty nine tells us they never contained above one verse or two at the most but the shorter the better two specimens may suffice the reader one under the symbol of a skull thus morally discourses content thyself with thine estate and send no poor wight from thy gate for why this counsel i you give to learn to die and die to live on another decorated with pictures of fruit are these satirical lines feed and be fat here's pears and plums will never hurt your teeth or spoil your gums and i wish those girls that painted are no other food than such fine painted fare End of footnote. and con them out of goldsmith's rings footnote this constant custom of engraving posies as they were termed on rings is noted by many authors of the elizabethan era lily in his euphues addresses the ladies for a favourable judgment on his work hoping it will be recorded as you do the posies in your rings which are always next to the finger not to be seen of him that holdeth you by the hand and yet known by you that wear them on your hands they were always engraved with inside of the ring a manuscript of the time of charles i furnishes us with a single posy of one line to this effect this hath alloy my love is pure from the same source we have the two following rhyming or double posies constancy and heaven are round and in this the emblems found wear me out love shall not waste love beyond time still is placed End of footnote the usurer in robert greene's groat's worth of wit compressed all his philosophy into the circle of his ring having learned sufficient latin to understand the proverbial motto of tu tibi sura the husband was reminded of his lordly authority when he only looked into his trencher 
one of its learned aphorisms having descended to us the calmest husbands make the stormiest wives the english proverbs of the populace most of which are still in circulation were collected by old john haywood footnote haywood's dialogue containing the number in effect of all the proverbs in the english tongue fifteen sixty one there are more editions of this little volume than wharton has noticed there is some humour in his narrative but his metre and his ribaldry are heavy taxes on our curiosity End of footnote. they are arranged by tusser for the parlour the guests chamber the hall table lessons etc not a small portion of our ancient proverbs were adapted to rural life when our ancestors lived more than ourselves amidst the works of god and less among those of men footnote the whole of tusser's five hundred points of good husbandry fifteen eighty was composed in quaint couplets long remembered by the peasantry for their homely worldly wisdom one constructed for the bakehouse runs thus new bread is a drivel parenthesis waste much crust is as evil another for the dairymaid assures her good dairy doth pleasure ill dairy spends treasure another might rival any lesson of thrift where nothing will last spare such as thou hast End of footnote at this time one of our old statesmen in commending the art of compressing a tedious discourse into a few significant phrases suggested the use of proverbs in diplomatic intercourse convinced of the great benefit which would result to the negotiators themselves as well as to others i give a literary curiosity of this kind a member of the house of commons in the reign of elizabeth made a speech entirely composed of the most homely proverbs the subject was a bill against double payments of book debts navy tradesmen were then in the habit of swelling out their book debts with those who took credit particularly to their younger customers one of the members who began to speak for very fear shook and stood silent the nervous orator was followed by a blunt and true representative of the famed governor of barataria delivering himself thus it is now my chance to speak something and that without humming or hawing i think this law is a good law even reckoning makes long friends as far goes the penny as the penny's master vigilantibus non dormientibus jura sub veniant pay the reckoning overnight and ye shall not be troubled in the morning if ready money be mensura publica let every one cut his coat according to his cloth when his old suit is in the wane let him stay till that his money bring a new suit in the increase another instance of the use of proverbs among our statesmen occurs in a manuscript letter of sir dudley carleton written in sixteen thirty two on the impeachment of lord middlesex who he says is this day to plead his own cause in the exchequer chamber about an account of fourscore thousand pounds laid to his charge how his lordship sped i know not but do remember well the french proverb qui mange de loi du roi chiera un plume quarante ans après who eats of the king's goose will void a feather forty years after this was the era of proverbs with us for then they were spoken by all ranks of society the free use of trivial proverbs got them into disrepute and as the abuse of a thing raises a just opposition to its practice a slender wit affecting a cross humour published a little volume of crossing of proverbs cross answers and cross humours he pretends to contradict the most popular ones but he has not always the genius to strike at amusing paradoxes footnote it was published in sixteen sixteen the writer only catches at some verbal expressions as for instance the vulgar proverb runs the more the merrier the cross not so one hand is enough in a purse the proverb it is a great way to the bottom of the sea the cross not so it is but a stone's cast the proverb the pride of the rich makes the labours of the poor the cross not so the labours of the poor make the pride of the rich the proverb he runs far who never turns 
the cross not so he may break his neck in a short course End of footnote. proverbs were long the favourites of our neighbours in the splendid and refined court of louis the fourteenth they gave rise to an odd invention they plotted comedies and even fantastical ballets from their subjects in these curiosities of literature i cannot pass by such eccentric inventions unnoticed a comedy of proverbs is described by the duc de la valliere which was performed in sixteen thirty four with prodigious success he considers that this comedy ought to be ranked among farces but it is gay well written and curious for containing the best proverbs which are happily introduced in the dialogue a more extraordinary attempt was a ballet of proverbs before the opera was established in france the ancient ballets formed the chief amusement of the court and louis the fourteenth himself joined with the performers the singular attempt of forming a pantomimical dance out of proverbs is quite french we have a ballet des proverbes dansé par le roi in sixteen fifty four at every proverb the scene changed and adapted itself to the subject i shall give two or three of the entree that we may form some notion of these caprizios the proverb was termenas qui a grand peur he threatens who is afraid the scene was composed of swaggering scaramouches and some honest cits who at length beat them off at another entree the proverb was l'occasion fait le larron opportunity makes the thief opportunity was acted by le sieur beaubrun but it is difficult to conceive how the real could personify the abstract personage the thieves were the duc d'amville and m de la chesnay another entree was the proverb of ce qui vient de la flûte sans va au tambour what comes by the pipe goes by the tabor a loose dissipated officer was performed by le sieur langlois the pipe by saint agnon and the tabor by le sieur le comte in this manner every proverb was spoken in action the whole connected by dialogue more must have depended on the actors than the poet footnote it has been suggested that this whimsical amusement has been lately revived to a certain degree in the acting of charades among juvenile parties End of footnote. the french long retained this fondness for proverbs for they still have dramatic compositions entitled proverbe on a more refined plan their invention is so recent that the term is not in their great dictionary of trivoux these proverbes are dramas of a single act invented by carmontel who possessed a peculiar vein of humour but who designed them only for private theatricals each proverb furnished a subject for a few scenes and created a situation powerfully comic it is a dramatic amusement which does not appear to have reached us but one which the celebrated catherine of russia delighted to compose for her own society among the middle classes of society to this day we may observe that certain family proverbs are traditionally preserved the favourite saying of a father is repeated by the sons and frequently the conduct of a whole generation has been influenced by such domestic proverbs this may be perceived in many of the mottoes of our old nobility which seem to have originated in some habitual proverb of the founder of the family in ages when proverbs were most prevalent such pithy sentences would admirably serve in the ordinary business of life and lead on to decision even in its greater exigencies orators by some lucky proverb without wearying their auditors would bring conviction home to their bosoms and great characters would appeal to a proverb or deliver that which in time by its aptitude became one when nero was reproached for the ardour with which he gave himself up to the study of music he replied to his censurers by the greek proverb an artist lives everywhere the emperor answered in the spirit of rousseau's system that every child should be taught some trade when caesar after anxious deliberation decided on the passage of the rubicon which very event has given rise to a proverb 
rousing himself with a start of courage he committed himself to fortune with that proverbial expression on his lips used by gamesters in desperate play having passed the rubicon he exclaimed the die is cast the answer of paulus emilius to the relations of his wife who had remonstrated with him on his determination to separate himself from her against whom no fault could be alleged has become one of our most familiar proverbs this hero acknowledged the excellences of his lady but requesting them to look on his shoe which appeared to be well made he observed none of you know where the shoe pinches he either used a proverbial phrase or by its aptness it has become one of the most popular there are indeed proverbs connected with the characters of eminent men they were either their favourite ones or have originated with themselves such a collection would form a historical curiosity to the celebrated bayard are the french indebted for a military proverb which some of them still repeat ce que le gantla gagne le gorgeron le mange what the gauntlet gets the gorget consumes that reflecting soldier well calculated the profits of a military life which consumes in the pomp and waste which are necessary for its maintenance the slender pay it receives and even what its rapacity sometimes acquires the favourite proverb of erasmus was festina lante hasten slowly footnote now the punning motto of a noble family in the footnote he wished it be inscribed wherever it could meet our eyes on public buildings and on our rings and seals one of our own statesmen used a favourite sentence which has enlarged our stock of national proverbs sir amius paulet when he perceived too much hurry in any business was accustomed to say stay a while to make an end the sooner oliver cromwell's coarse but descriptive proverb conveys the contempt he felt for some of his mean and troublesome coadjutors nits will be lice the italians have a proverb which has been occasionally applied to certain political personages eglie quello che dio vuole e sara quello che dio vora he is what god pleases he shall be what god wills ere this was a proverb it had served as an embroidered motto on the mystical mantle of castruccio castracciani that military genius who sought to revolutionize italy and aspired to its sovereignty lived long enough to repent the wild romantic ambition which provoked all italy to confederate against him the mysterious motto he assumed entered into the proverbs of his country the border proverb of the douglases it were better to hear the lark sing than the mouse cheap was adopted by every border chief to express as sir walter scott observes what the great bruce had pointed out that the woods and hills of their country were their safest bulwarks instead of the fortified places which the english surpassed their neighbours in the arts of assaulting or defending these illustrations indicate one of the sources of proverbs they have often resulted from the spontaneous emotions or the profound reflections of some extraordinary individual whose energetic expression was caught by a faithful ear never to perish End of section five. section six of curiosities of literature volume three this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3 by Isaac Disraeli. The Philosophy of Proverbs, Part 2. The poets have been very busy with proverbs in all the languages of Europe. Some appear to have been the favorite lines of some ancient poem even in more refined times many of the pointed verses of boileau and pope have become proverbial many trivial and laconic proverbs bear the jingle of alliteration or rhyme which assisted their circulation and were probably struck off extempore a manner which swift practised who was a ready coiner of such rhyming and ludicrous proverbs delighting to startle a collector by his facetious or sarcastic humour 
in the shape of an old saying and true some of these rhyming proverbs are however terse and elegant we have little strokes fell great oaks the italian ci duo lepricaccia uno perde el l'altro lastia who hunts two hares loses one and leaves the other the haughty spaniard el dar es sonor yell pedir dolor to give his honour to ask his grief and the french ami de table est variable the friend of the table is very variable the composers of these short proverbs were a numerous race of poets who probably among the dreams of their immortality never suspected that they were to descend to posterity themselves and their works unknown while their extempore thoughts would be repeated by their own nation proverbs were at length consigned to the people when books were addressed to scholars but the people did not find themselves so destitute of practical wisdom by preserving their national proverbs as some of those closet students who had ceased to repeat them the various humours of mankind in the mutability of human affairs had given birth to every species and men were wise or merry or satirical and mourned or rejoiced in proverbs nations held an universal intercourse of proverbs from the eastern to the western world for we discover among those which appear strictly national many which are common to them all of our own familiar ones several may be tracked among the snows of the latins and the greeks and have sometimes been drawn from the mines of the east like decayed families which remain in obscurity they may boast of a high lineal descent whenever they recover their lost title deeds the vulgar proverb to carry coals to newcastle local and idiomatic as it appears however has been borrowed and applied by ourselves it may be found among the persians in the bustan of saadi we have infares piper in hindustan to carry pepper to hindustan among the hebrews to carry oil to the city of olives a similar proverb occurs in greek and in galan's maxims of the east we may discover how many of the most common proverbs among us as well as some of joe miller's jests are of oriental origin the resemblance of certain proverbs in different nations must however be often ascribed to the identity of human nature similar situations and similar objects have unquestionably made men think and act and express themselves alike all nations are parallels of each other hence all periographers or collectors of proverbs complain of the difficulty of separating their own national proverbs from those which have crept into the language from others particularly when nations have held much intercourse together we have a copious collection of scottish proverbs by kelly but this learned man was mortified at discovering that many which he had long believed to have been genuine scottish were not only english but french italian spanish latin and greek ones many of his scottish proverbs are almost literally expressed among the fragments of remote antiquity it would have surprised him further had he been aware that his greek originals were themselves but copies and might have been found in derbelo erpenius and golius and in many asiatic works which have been more recently introduced to the enlarged knowledge of the european student who formerly found his most extended researches limited by hellenistic lore perhaps it was owing to an accidental circumstance that the proverbs of the european nations have been preserved in the permanent form of volumes erasmus is usually considered as the first modern collector but he appears to have been preceded by polydor virgil who bitterly reproaches erasmus with envy and plagiarism for passing by his collection without even a poor compliment for the inventor polydor was a vain superficial writer who prided himself in leading the way on more topics than the present erasmus with his usual pleasantry provokingly excuses himself 
by acknowledging that he had forgotten his friend's book few sympathize with the quarrels of authors and since erasmus has written a far better book than polydore virgil's the original adagia is left only to be commemorated in literary history as one of its curiosities footnote at the royal institution there is a fine copy of polydore virgil's adagia with his other work curious in its day de inventoribus rerum printed by frobenius in 1521 the woodcuts of this edition seem to me to be executed with inimitable delicacy resembling a pencilling which raphael might have envied End of footnote the adagia of erasmus contains a collection of about five thousand proverbs gradually gathered from a constant study of the ancients erasmus blessed with the genius which could enliven a folio delighted himself in all europe by the continued accessions he made to a volume which even now may be the companion of literary men for a winter's day's fireside the successful example of erasmus commanded the imitation of the learned in europe and drew their attention to their own national proverbs some of the most learned men and some not sufficiently so were now occupied in this new study in spain fernandez nunez a greek professor and the marquis of santillana a grandee published collections of their refranes or proverbs a term derived a referendo because it is often repeated the refranes o proverbios castellanos par cesar uden sixteen twenty four translated into french is a valuable compilation in cervantes and quevedo the best practical illustrators they are sown with no sparing hand there is an ample collection of italian proverbs by florio who was an englishman of italian origin and who published il giardino di ricreatione at london so early as in fifteen ninety one exceeding six thousand proverbs but they are unexplained and are often obscure another italian in england torriano in sixteen forty nine published an interesting collection in the diminutive form of a twenty fours it was subsequent to these publications in england that in italy angelus monozini in sixteen o four published his collection and julius varini in sixteen forty two produced his scuolo del vulgo in france Houdin, after others had preceded him published a collection of french proverbs under the title of curiosite Françoise fleury de Belangeon, explication du proverbe francois on comparing it with les illustres proverbes historiques a subsequent publication i discovered to be the same work it is the first attempt to render the study of proverbs somewhat amusing the plan consists of a dialogue between a philosopher and a sancho panca who blurts out his proverbs with more delight than understanding the philosopher takes that opportunity of explaining them by the events in which they originated which however are not always to be depended on a work of high merit on french proverbs is the unfinished one of the abbe Touet, sensible and learned a collection of danish proverbs accompanied by a french translation was printed at copenhagen in a quarto volume seventeen sixty one england may boast of no inferior paremiographers the grave and judicious camden the religious herbert the entertaining howell the facetious fuller and the laborious ray with others have preserved our national sayings the scottish have been largely collected and explained by the learned kelly an excellent anonymous collection not uncommon in various languages seventeen o seven the collector and translator was dr j maple toft it must be acknowledged that although no nation exceeds our own in sterling sense we rarely rival the delicacy the wit and the felicity of expression of the spanish and the italian and the poignancy of some of the french proverbs the interest we may derive from the study of proverbs is not confined to their universal truths nor to their poignant pleasantry 
a philosophical mind will discover in proverbs a great variety of the most curious knowledge the manners of a people are painted after life in their domestic proverbs and it would not be advancing too much to assert that the genius of the age might be often detected in its prevalent ones the learned selden tells us that the proverbs of several nations were much studied by bishop andrews the reason assigned was because by them he knew the minds of several nations which said he is a brave thing as we count him wise who knows the minds and the insides of men which is done by knowing what is habitual to them lord bacon condensed a wide circuit of philosophical thought when he observed that the genius wit and spirit of a nation are discovered by their proverbs proverbs peculiarly national while they convey to us the modes of thinking will consequently indicate the modes of acting among a people the romans had a proverbial expression for their last stake in play rem ad triarios venisi the reserve are engaged a proverbial expression from which the military habits of the people might be inferred the triarii being their reserve a proverb has preserved a curious custom of ancient coxcombry which originally came from the greeks the men of effeminate manners in their dress they applied the proverb of unico digitulo scalpit caput scratching the head with a single finger was it seems done by the critically nice youths in rome that they might not discompose the economy of their hair the arab whose unsettled existence makes him miserable and interested says vinegar given is better than honey bought everything of high esteem with him who is so often parched in the desert is described as milk how large his flow of milk is a proverbial expression with the arab to distinguish the most copious eloquence to express a state of perfect repose the arabian proverb is i throw the rein over my back an allusion to the loosening of the cords of the camels which are thrown over their backs when they are sent to pasture we discover the rustic manners of our ancient britons in the cambrian proverbs many relate to the hedge the cleanly briton is seen in the hedge the horse looks not on the hedge but the corn the bad husband's hedge is full of gaps the state of an agricultural people appears in such proverbs as you must not count your yearlings till may-day and their proverbial sentence for old age is an old man's end is to keep sheep turn from the vagrant arab and the agricultural briton to a nation existing in a high state of artificial civilization the chinese proverbs frequently allude to magnificent buildings affecting a more solemn exterior than all other nations a favorite proverb with them is a grave and majestic outside is as it were the palace of the soul their notion of a government is quite architectural they say a sovereign may be compared to a hall his officers to the steps that lead to it the people to the ground on which they stand what should we think of a people who had a proverb that he who gives blows is a master he who gives none is a dog we should instantly decide on the mean and servile spirit of those who could repeat it and such we find to have been that of the bengalese to whom the degrading proverb belongs derived from the treatment that they were used to receive from their mogul rulers who answered the claims of their creditors by a vigorous application of the whip in some of the hebrew proverbs we are struck by the frequent allusions of that fugitive people to their own history the cruel oppression exercised by the ruling power and the confidence in their hope of change in the day of retribution was delivered in this hebrew proverb when the tale of bricks is doubled moses comes the fond idolatry of their devotion to their ceremonial law and to everything connected with their sublime theocracy in their magnificent temple is finely expressed by this proverb none ever took a stone out of the temple but the dust did fly into his eyes the hebrew proverb that a fast for a dream is as fire for a stubble which it kindles could only have been invented by a people 
whose superstitions attached a holy mystery to fasts and dreams they imagined that a religious fast was propitious to a religious dream or to obtain the interpretation of one which had troubled their imagination Paysanel, who long resided among the turks observes that their proverbs are full of sense ingenuity and elegance the surest test of the intellectual abilities of any nation he said this to correct the volatile opinion of de tot who to convey an idea of their stupid pride quotes one of their favourite adages of which the truth and candour are admirable riches in the indies wit in europe and pomp among the ottomans the spaniards may appeal to their proverbs to show that they were a high-minded and independent race a whiggish jealousy of monarchical power stamped itself on this ancient one va el rey hasta do puede y no hasta do quiere the king goes as far as he is able not as far as he desires it must have been at a later period when the national genius became more subdued and every spaniard dreaded to find under his own roof a spy or an informer that another proverb arose con el rey y la inquisicion chiton with the king and the inquisition hush the gravity and taciturnity of the nation have been ascribed to the effects of this proverb their popular but suppressed feelings on taxation and on a variety of dues exacted by their clergy were murmured in proverbs lo que no leva cristo leva el fisco what christ takes not the exchequer carries away they have a number of sarcastic proverbs on the tenacious grip of the abad aviento their avaricious priest who having eaten the olio offered claims the dish a striking mixture of chivalric habits domestic decency and epicurean comfort appears in the spanish proverb la mugre y la salsa a la mano de la lanca the wife and the sauce by the hand of the lance to honour the dame and to have the sauce near the italian proverbs have taken a tinge from their deep and politic genius and their wisdom seems wholly concentrated in their personal interests i think every tenth proverb in an italian collection is some cynical or some selfish maxim a book of the world for worldlings the venetian proverb pria veneziana poi christiana first venetian and then christian condenses the whole spirit of their ancient republic into the smallest space possible their political proverbs no doubt arose from the extraordinary state of a people sometimes distracted among republics and sometimes servile in petty courts the italian says e popoli samazzano ed e principi sabracciano the people murder one another and princes embrace one another ci pratica co grandi l'ultima a travolo el primo a strapazzi who dangles after the great is the last at table and the first at blows chi non sa adalare non sa regnare who knows not to flatter knows not to reign chi serve in corte muore sul pagliato who serves at court dies on straw wary cunning in domestic life is perpetually impressed an italian proverb which is immortalized in our language for it enters into the history of milton was that by which the elegant wotton counselled the young poetic traveller to have il viso sciolto ed i pensieri stretti an open countenance but close thoughts in the same spirit ci parla semina ci trace raccoglie the talker sows the silent reaps as well as fati di miele e ti mangiaran la masca make yourself all honey and the flies will devour you there are some which display a deep knowledge of human nature a luca ti vidi a pisa ti canobi i saw you at luca i knew you at pisa guardati da ceto di vin dolce beware of vinegar made of sweet wine provoke not the rage of a patient man among a people who had often witnessed their fine country devastated by petty warfare 
their notion of the military character was not usually heroic il soldato per far male e ben pagato the soldier is well paid for doing mischief soldato acqua e fuoco presto si fan luoco a soldier fire and water soon make room for themselves but in a poetical people endowed with great sensibility their proverbs would sometimes be tender and fanciful they paint the activity of friendship chi ha l'amor nel petto ha lo sprone a i franchi who feels love in the breast feels a spur in his limbs or its generous passion gli amici legono la borsca con un filo di ragnatelo friends tie their purse with a cobweb's thread they characterize the universal lover by an elegant proverb apicare il maro ad agnonuscio to hang every door with may alluding to the bough which in the nights of may the country people are accustomed to plant before the door of their mistress if we turn to the french we discover that the military genius of france dictated the proverb maya a maya se fait le haubergeon link by link is made the coat of mail and tell coup de langue aspire qu'un coup de lance the tongue strikes deeper than the lance and ce qui vient du tambour s'en retourne à la flûte what comes by the table goes back with the pipe point d'argent point de suisse has become proverbial observes an edinburgh reviewer a striking expression which while french or austrian gold predominated was justly used to characterize the illiberal and selfish policy of the cantonal and federal governments of switzerland when it began to degenerate from its moral patriotism the ancient perhaps the extinct spirit of englishmen was once expressed by our proverb better be the head of a dog than the tail of a lion that is the first of the yeomanry rather than the last of the gentry a foreign philosopher might have discovered our own ancient skill in archery among our proverbs for none but true toxophilites could have had such a proverb as i will either make a shaft or a bolt of it signifying says the author of ivanhoe a determination to make one use or other of the things spoken of the bolt was the arrow peculiarly fitted to the crossbow as that of the longbow was called a shaft these instances sufficiently demonstrate that the characteristic circumstances and feelings of a people are discovered in their popular notions and stamped on their familiar proverbs it is also evident that the peculiar and often idiomatic humour of a people is best preserved in their proverbs there is a shrewdness although deficient in delicacy in the scottish proverbs they are idiomatic facetious and strike home kelly who has collected three thousand informs us that in seventeen twenty five the scotch were a great proverbial nation for that few among the better sort will converse any considerable time but will confirm every assertion and observation with a scottish proverb the speculative scotch of our own times have probably degenerated in prudential lore and deem themselves much wiser than their proverbs they may reply by a scotch proverb on proverbs made by a great man in scotland who having given a splendid entertainment was harshly told that fools make feasts and wise men eat them but he readily answered wise men make proverbs and fools repeat them national humour frequently local and idiomatical depends on the artificial habits of mankind so opposite to each other but there is a natural vein which the populace always true to nature preserve even among the gravest people the arabian proverb the barber learns his art on the orphan's face the chinese in a field of melons do not pull up your shoe under a plum tree do not adjust your cap to impress caution in our conduct under circumstances of suspicion and the hebrew one he that hath had one of his family hanged may not say to his neighbour hang up this fish are all instances of this sort of humour the spaniards are a grave people but no nation has equalled them in their peculiar humour the genius of cervantes partook largely of that of his country that mantle of gravity which almost conceals its latent facetiousness and with which he has imbued his style and manner with such untranslatable idiomatic raciness may be traced to the proverbial erudition of his nation 
to steal a sheep and give away the trotters for god's sake is cervantic nature to one who is seeking an opportunity to quarrel with another their proverb runs si quereris dar palos asur mugur pedele a sola bever hast thou a mind to quarrel with thy wife bid her bring water to thee in the sunshine a very fair quarrel may be picked up about the moats in the clearest water on the judges in galicia who like our former justices of peace for half a dozen chickens would dispense with a dozen of penal statutes a uezes galicianos con los pies son las manos to the judges of galicia go with feet in hand a droll allusion to a present of poultry usually held by the legs to describe persons who live high without visible means los que cabritos venden y cabras no tienen de donde los vienen they that sell kids and have no goats how came they by them el vino no trae bragas wine wears no breeches for men in wine expose their most secret thoughts vino de un orella wine of one ear is good wine for at bad shaking our heads both our ears are visible but at good the spaniard by a natural gesticulation lowering on one side shows a single ear proverbs abounding in sarcastic humour and found among every people are those which are pointed at rival countries among ourselves hardly has a county escaped from some popular quip even neighbouring towns have their sarcasms usually pickled in some unlucky rhyme the egotism of man eagerly seizes on whatever serves to depreciate or to ridicule his neighbour nations proverb each other counties flout counties obscure towns sharpen their wits on towns as obscure as themselves the same evil principle lurking in poor human nature if it cannot always assume predominance will meanly gratify itself by insult or contempt they expose some prevalent folly or allude to some disgrace which the natives have incurred in france the burgundians have a proverb mieux vaut bon repas que bel habit better a good dinner than a fine coat these good people are great gormandizers but shabby dressers they are commonly said to have bowels of silk and velvet this is all their silk and velvet goes for their bowels thus picardy is famous for hotheads and the norman for son di e son dedi his saying and his unsaying in italy the numerous rival cities pelt one another with proverbs chi ha a fare con tosco non convien esser losco he who deals with a tuscan must not have his eyes shut a venetia chi nasce mal vi si pasque whom venice breeds she poorly feeds there is another source of national characteristics frequently producing strange or whimsical combinations a people from a very natural circumstance have drawn their proverbs from local objects or from allusions to peculiar customs the influence of manners and customs over the ideas and language of a people would form a subject of extensive and curious research there is a japanese proverb that a fog cannot be dispelled with a fan had we not known the origin of this proverb it would be evident that it could only have occurred to a people who had constantly before them fogs and fans and the fact appears that fogs are frequent on the coast of japan and that from the age of five years both sexes of the japanese carry fans the spaniards have an odd proverb to describe those who tease and vex a person before they do him the very benefit which they are about to confer acting kindly but speaking roughly monstra primero la horca que la lugar to show the gallows before they show the town a circumstance alluding to their small towns which have a gallows placed on an eminence so that the gallows breaks on the eye of the traveller before he gets a view of the town itself the cheshire proverb on marriage better wed over the mixen than over the moor that is at home or in its vicinity mixen alludes to the dung etc in the farmyard while the road from chester to london is over the moorland in staffordshire this local proverb is a curious instance of provincial pride perhaps of wisdom to induce the gentry of that county to form intermarriages to prolong their own ancient families and perpetuate 
ancient friendships between them in the isle of man a proverbial expression forcibly indicates the object constantly occupying the minds of the inhabitants the two deemsters or judges when appointed to the chair of judgment declare they will render justice between man and man as equally as the herring-bone lies between the two sides an image which could not have occurred to any people unaccustomed to the herring fishery there is a cornish proverb those who will not be ruled by the rudder must be ruled by the rock the strands of cornwall so often covered with wrecks could not fail to impress on the imaginations of its inhabitants the two objects from whence they drew this salutary proverb against obstinate wrongheads when scotland in the last century felt its allegiance to england doubtful and when the french sent an expedition to the land of cakes a local proverb was revived to show the identity of interests which affected both nations if skiddaw hath a cap scruffle wots full well of that these are two high hills one in scotland and one in england so near that what happens to the one will not be long ere it reach the other if a fog lodges on the one it is sure to rain on the other the mutual sympathies of the two countries were hence deduced in a copious dissertation by oswald dyke on what was called the union proverb which local proverbs of our country fuller has interspersed in his worthies and ray and gross have collected separately i was amused lately by a curious financial revelation which i found in an opposition paper where it appears that ministers pretend to make their load of taxes more portable by shifting the burden or altering the pressure without however diminishing the weight according to the italian proverb accomodare verbisacie nella strada to fit the load on the journey it is taken from a custom of the mule drivers who placing their packages at first but awkwardly on the backs of their poor beasts and seeing them ready to sink cry out never mind we must fit them better on the road i was gratified to discover by the present and some other modern instances that the taste for proverbs was reviving and that we were returning to those sober times when the aptitude of a simple proverb would be preferred to the verbosity of politicians tories whigs or radicals end of section six section seven of curiosities of literature volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume three by isaac disraeli the philosophy of proverbs part three there are domestic proverbs which originate in incidents known only to the natives of their province italian literature is particularly rich in these stores the lively proverbial taste of that vivacious people was transferred to their own authors and when these allusions were obscured by time learned italians in their zeal for their national literature and in their national love of story-telling have written grave commentaries even on ludicrous but popular tales in which the proverbs are said to have originated they resemble the old facetious Kant, whose simplicity and humour still live in the pages of boccaccio and are not forgotten in those of the queen of navarre the italians apply a proverb to a person who while he is beaten takes the blows quietly per beato cel non furon pesca luckily they were not peaches and to threaten to give a man una pesca in un occhio a peach in the eye means to give him a thrashing this proverb it is said originated in the close of a certain droll adventure the community of the castle pogibonzi probably from some jocular tenure observed on st bernard's day pay a tribute of peaches to the court of tuscany which are usually shared among the ladies-in-waiting and the pages of the court 
it happened one season in a great scarcity of peaches that the good people of poggi bonsi finding them rather dear sent instead of the customary tribute a quantity of fine juicy figs which was so much disapproved of by the pages that as soon as they got hold of them they began in rage to empty the baskets on the heads of the ambassadors of the poggi bonsi who in attempting to fly as well as they could from the pulpy shower half blinded and recollecting that peaches would have had stones in them cried out per beato cel non furon pesca luckily they were not peaches fare l'urscale di sant ambrogio to mount the stairs of st ambrose a proverb allusive to the business of the school of scandal varchi explains it by a circumstance so common in provincial cities on summer evenings for fresh air and gossip the loungers met on the steps and landing-places of the church of st ambrose whoever left the party they read in his book as our commentator expresses it and not a leaf was passed over all liked to join a party so well informed of one another's concerns and every one tried to be the very last to quit it not to leave his character behind it became a proverbial phrase with those who left a company and were too tender of their backs to request they would not mount the stairs of st ambrose johnson has well described such a company you are so truly feared but not beloved one of another as no one dares break company from the rest lest they should fall upon him absent there are legends and histories which belong to proverbs and some of the most ancient refer to incidents which have not always been commemorated two greek proverbs have accidentally been explained by pausanias he is a man of tenedos to describe a person of unquestionable veracity and to cut with the tenedian axe to express an absolute and irrevocable refusal the first originated in a king of tenedos who decreed that there should always stand behind the judge a man holding an axe ready to execute justice on any one convicted of falsehood the other arose from the same king whose father having reached his island to supplicate the son's forgiveness for the injury inflicted on him by the arts of a stepmother was preparing to land already the ship was fastened by its cable to a rock when the sun came down and sternly cutting the cable with an axe sent the ship adrift to the mercy of the waves hence to cut with the tenedian axe became proverbial to express an absolute refusal business to-morrow is another greek proverb applied to a person ruined by his own neglect the fate of an eminent person perpetuated the expression which he casually employed on the occasion one of the theban polemarchs in the midst of a convivial party received dispatches relating to a conspiracy flushed with wine although pressed by the courier to open them immediately he smiled and in gaiety laying the letter under the pillow of his couch observed business to-morrow plutarch records that he fell a victim to the twenty-four hours he had lost and became the author of a proverb which was still circulated among the greeks the philosophical antiquary may often discover how many a proverb commemorates an event which has escaped from the more solemn monuments of history and is often the solitary authority of its existence a national event in spanish history is preserved by a proverb e vengar quinentio sueldus and revenge five hundred pounds an odd expression to denote a person being a gentleman but the proverb is historical the spaniards of old castile were compelled to pay an annual tribute of five hundred maidens to their masters the moors after several battles the spaniards succeeded in compromising the shameful tribute by as many pieces of coin at length the day arrived when they entirely 
emancipated themselves from this odious imposition the heroic action was performed by men of distinction and the event perpetuated in the recollections of the spaniards by this singular expression which alludes to the dishonourable tribute was applied to characterise all men of high honour and devoted lovers of their country pasquier in his recherche sur la france reviewing the periodical changes of ancient families in feudal times observes that a proverb among the common people conveys the result of all his inquiries for those noble houses which in a single age declined from nobility and wealth to poverty and meanness gave rise to the proverb sans en bannière et sans en civière one hundred years a banner and one hundred years a barrow the italian proverb con l'evangelio si diventa heretico with the gospel we become heretics reflects the policy of the court of rome and must be dated at the time of the reformation when a translation of the scriptures into the vulgar tongue encountered such an invincible opposition the scotch proverb he that invented the maiden first hanselled it that is got the first of it the maiden is that well-known beheading engine revived by the french surgeon guillotine this proverb may be applied to one who falls a victim to his own ingenuity the artificer of his own destruction the inventor was james earl of morton who for some years governed scotland and afterwards it is said very unjustly suffered by his own invention it is a striking coincidence that the same fate was shared by the french reviver both alike sad examples of disturbed times among our own proverbs a remarkable incident has been commemorated hand over head as the men took the covenant this preserves the manner in which the scotch covenant so famous in our history was violently taken by above sixty thousand persons about edinburgh in sixteen thirty eight a circumstance at that time novel in our own revolutionary history and afterwards paralleled by the french in voting by acclamation an ancient english proverb preserves a curious fact concerning our coinage testers are gone to oxford to study at rosinos when henry the eighth debased the silver coin called testers from their having a head stamped on one side the brass breaking out in red pimples on their silver faces provoked the ill-humour of the people to vent itself in this punning proverb which has preserved for historical antiquary the popular feeling which lasted about fifty years till elizabeth reformed the state of the coinage a northern proverb among us has preserved the remarkable idea which seems to have once been prevalent that the metropolis of england was to be the city of york lincoln was london is york shall be whether at the time of the union of the crowns under james the first when england and scotland became great britain this city from its centrical situation was considered as the best adapted for the seat of government or for some other cause which i have not discovered this notion must have been prevalent to have entered into a proverb the chief magistrate of york is the only provincial one who is allowed the title of lord mayor a circumstance which seems connected with this proverb the italian history of its own small principalities whose well-being so much depended on their prudence and sagacity affords many instances of the timely use of a proverb many an intricate negotiation has been contracted through a good-humoured proverb many a sarcastic one has silenced an adversary and sometimes they have been applied on more solemn and even tragical occasions when rinaldo degli abizzi was banished by the vigorous conduct of cosmo de medici machiavel tells us the expelled man sent cosmo a menace in a proverb la gallina cavava the hen is brooding said of one meditating vengeance the undaunted cosmo replied by another that there was no brooding out of the nest 
i give an example of peculiar interest for it is perpetuated by dante and is connected with the character of milton when the families of the amadi and the uberti felt their honour wounded in the affront the younger buon del monte had put upon them in breaking off his match with a young lady of their family by marrying another a council was held and the death of the young cavalier was proposed as the sole atonement for their injured honour but the consequences which they anticipated and which afterwards proved so fatal to the florentines long suspended their decision at length mosca lamberti suddenly rising exclaimed in two proverbs that those who considered everything would never conclude on anything closing with an ancient proverbial saying cosa fata capo ha a deed done has an end the proverb sealed the fatal determination and was long held in mournful remembrance by the tuscans for according to villani it was the cause and beginning of the accursed factions of the guelphs and the ghibellines dante has thus immortalized the energetic expression in a scene of the inferno adun chavea luna el alatra man mazza levando e manchera per lara fasca si chai langue fascia la faccia sozza guido ricorderati ancha del masca che dissi lasso capo ha cosa fatta che ful mal seme della gente tasca then one maimed of each hand uplifted in the gloom the bleeding stumps that they with gory spots sullied his face and cried remember thee of mosca too i who alas exclaimed the deed once done there is an end that proved a seed of sorrow to the tuscan race carries dante this italian proverb was adopted by milton for when deeply engaged in writing the defence of the people and warned that it might terminate in his blindness he resolvedly concluded his work exclaiming with great magnanimity although the fatal prognostication had been accomplished cosa fata capo ha did this proverb also influence his awful decision on that great national event when the most honest minded fluctuated between doubts and fears of a person treacherously used the italian proverb says that he has eaten of la frutta di fratra alberigo the fruit of brother alberigo landino on the following passage of dante preserves the tragic story io son fratre alberigo io son quel dalla frutta del mal orto che qui reprendo etc canto thirty three the friar alberigo answered he am i who from the evil garden plucked its fruitage and am here repaid the date more luscious for my fig carries dante this was manfred the lord of fuenza who after many cruelties turned friar reconciling himself to those whom he had so often opposed to celebrate the renewal of their friendship he invited them to a magnificent entertainment at the end of the dinner the horn blew to announce the dessert but it was the signal of this dissimulating conspirator and the fruits which that day were served to his guests were armed men who rushing in immolated their victims among these historical proverbs none are more entertaining than those which perpetuate national events connected with those of another people when a frenchman would let us understand that he has settled with his creditors the proverb is j'ai payé tous mes anglois i have paid all my english this proverb originated when john the french king was taken prisoner by our black prince levies of money were made for the king's ransom and for many french lords and the french people have thus perpetuated the military glory of our nation and their own idea of it by making the english and their creditors synonymous terms another relates to the same event le pape 
devenu francois et jésus christ anglais now the pope has become french and jesus christ english a proverb which arose when the pope exiled from rome held his court at avignon in france and the english prospered so well that they possessed more than half the kingdom the spanish proverb concerning england is well known con todo el mando guerra y paz con inglaterra war with the world and peace with england whether this proverb was one of the results of their memorable armada and was only coined after their conviction of the splendid folly which they had committed i cannot ascertain england must always have been a desirable ally to spain against her potent rival and neighbour the italians have a proverb which formerly at least was strongly indicative of the travelled englishmen in their country inglese italianato e un diavolo incarnato the italianized englishman is a devil incarnate formerly there existed a closer intercourse between our country and italy than with france before and during the reigns of elizabeth and james i that land of the elegant arts modelled our taste and manners and more italians travelled into england and were more constant residents from commercial concerns than afterwards when france assumed a higher rank in europe by her political superiority this cause will sufficiently account for the number of italian proverbs relating to england which show an intimacy with our manners that could not else have occurred it was probably some sarcastic italian and perhaps horologer who to describe the disagreement of persons proverbed our nation they agree like the clocks of london we were once better famed for merry christmases and their pies and it must have been the italians who had been domiciliated with us who gave currency to the proverb ha pio da fere che i forni di natale in inghilterra he has more business than english ovens at christmas our pie-loving gentry were notorious and shakespeare's folio was usually laid open in the great halls of our nobility to entertain their attendants who devoured at once shakespeare and their pasty some of those volumes have come down to us not only with the stains but enclosing even the identical pie-crusts of the elizabethan age i have thus attempted to develop the art of reading proverbs but have done little more than indicate the theory and must leave the skilful student to the delicacy of the practice i am anxious to rescue from prevailing prejudices these neglected stores of curious amusement and of deep insight into the ways of man and to point out the bold and concealed truths which are scattered in these collections there seems to be no occurrence in human affairs to which some proverb may not be applied all knowledge was long aphoristical and traditional pithily contracting the discoveries which were to be instantly comprehended and easily retained whatever be the revolutionary state of man similar principles and like occurrences are returning on us and antiquity whenever it is justly applicable to our times loses its denomination and becomes the truth of our own age a proverb will often cut the knot which others in vain are attempting to untie johnson palled with the redundant elegancies of modern composition once said i fancy mankind may come in time to write all aphoristically except in narrative grow weary of preparation and connection and illustration and all those arts by which a big book is made many a volume indeed has often been written to demonstrate what a lover of proverbs could show had long been ascertained by a single one in his favourite collections an insurmountable difficulty which every periographer has encountered is that of forming an apt a ready and a systematic classification the moral linnaeus of such a systema naturae has not yet appeared each discovered his predecessor's mode imperfect but each was doomed to meet the same fate footnote 
since the appearance of the present article several collections of proverbs have been attempted a little unpretending volume entitled select proverbs of all nations with notes and comments by thomas fielding eighteen twenty four is not ill arranged an excellent book for popular reading the editor of a recent miscellaneous compilation the treasury of knowledge has whimsically bordered the four sides of the pages of a dictionary with as many proverbs the plan was ingenious but the proverbs are not triteness and triviality are fatal to a proverb End of footnote the arrangement of proverbs has baffled the ingenuity of every one of their collectors our ray after long premeditation has chosen a system with the appearance of an alphabetical order but as it turns out his system is no system and his alphabet is no alphabet after ten years labour the good man could only arrange his proverbs by commonplaces by complete sentences by phrases or forms of speech by proverbial similes and so on all these are pursued in alphabetical order by the first letter of the most material word or if there be more words equally material by that which usually stands foremost the most patient examiner will usually find that he wants the sagacity of the collector to discover that word which is the most material or the words equally material we have to search through all that multiplicity of divisions or conjuring boxes in which this juggler of proverbs pretends to hide the ball footnote a new edition of ray's book with large additions was published by bond in eighteen fifty five under the title of a handbook of proverbs it is a vast collection of wise saws of all ages and countries End of footnote a still more formidable objection against a collection of proverbs for the impatient reader is their unreadableness taking in succession a multitude of insulated proverbs their slippery nature resists all hope of retaining one in a hundred the study of proverbs must be a frequent recurrence to a gradual collection of favourite ones which we ourselves must form the experience of life will throw a perpetual freshness over these short and simple texts every day may furnish a new commentary and we may grow old and find novelty in proverbs by their perpetual application there are perhaps about twenty thousand proverbs among the nations of europe many of these have spread in their common intercourse many are borrowed from the ancients chiefly the greeks who themselves largely took them from the eastern nations our own proverbs are too often deficient in that elegance and ingenuity which are often found in the spanish and the italian proverbs frequently enliven conversation or enter into the business of life in those countries without any feeling of vulgarity being associated with them they are too numerous too witty and too wise to cease to please by their poignancy and their aptitude i have heard them fall from the lips of men of letters and of statesmen when recently the disorderly state of the manufacturers of manchester menaced an insurrection a profound italian politician observed to me that it was not of a nature to alarm a great nation for that the remedy was at hand in the proverb of the lazzaroni of naples meta consiglio meta and sepio meta denaro half advice half example half money the result confirmed the truth of the proverb which had it been known at the time might have quieted the honest fears of a great part of the nation proverbs have ceased to be studied or employed in conversation since the time we have derived our knowledge from books but in a philosophical age they appear to offer infinite subjects for speculative curiosity originating in various eras these memorials of manners of events and of modes of thinking for historical as well as for moral purposes still retain a strong hold on our attention the collected knowledge of successive ages and of different people must always enter into some part of our own truth and nature can never be obsolete proverbs embrace the wide sphere of human existence they take all the colours of life 
they are often exquisite strokes of genius they delight by their airy sarcasm or their caustic satire the luxuriance of their humour the playfulness of their turn and even by the elegance of their imagery and the tenderness of their sentiment they give a deep insight into domestic life and open for us the heart of man in all the various states which he may occupy a frequent review of proverbs should enter into our readings and although they are no longer the ornaments of conversation they have not ceased to be the treasuries of thought End of section seven.